I, I was away yesterday, and when I got home last night, my buddy, also known as the UPS man, had made my Amazon delivery. Uh, he does it all the time. Uh, but this one I was excited about. Can, can you see what he gave me? He brought me my vitamin C. I've been waiting for this for like three weeks because I can't get it anywhere. Uh, I've been taking vitamin C every single day for years uh, in what is probably the completely vain hope that in taking vitamin C, I will have this little supplement in my life that'll keep me healthy and therefore happy. Because when I get the common cold, I am not a very pleasant human being. Ask Pastor Greg. I took it last night got my vitamin C, and I'll be honest and forgive the analogy, but I was looking at it and I thought, wow, Jesus, how many times in my life have I treated Jesus like he's the equivalent of vitamin C? I guess that makes him vitamin J. You know what I mean? Where I've looked at Jesus and said, I really would love for you to be this little add-on, you know, this supplement that I include in my regular diet. Uh, I'll pray a little bit. I'll read the Bible a little bit. I'll show up even to Zoom church in the hope that with this add-on to my life, a little bit of Jesus, he'll make me healthy and he'll keep me happy. You know, as we've been going through for the last month, and we will be throughout the rest of this month, going through all of these interactions that the resurrected Jesus has with individual people, I hope that you're seeing uh, over and over again that Jesus is not the least bit interested in being the equivalent of a spiritual vitamin, an add-on, a supplement to the rest of our life. When the resurrected Jesus shows up to the disciples and he shows them his scars and he breathes his spirit and he sends them out, he looks at us and he says, I am here not to add to your life, but to rule it. I, I want to reign as king. His desire is to resurrect us. Indeed, to use the language we've been using, to rewrite our stories. And you know, if you can turn your brain on and think about that for just one second, you're probably going to get scared. I mean, it's a scary reality to think that Jesus refuses to be an addition to my life and the way I want it run, that he is instead committed to ruling my life and rewriting my story. The thing about Jesus is that, yes, he is scary, and he is safe, Completely safe, as a matter of fact. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, puts it in the Chronicles of Narnia where he talks about Aslan, who is the lion, who is um, the Christ figure in the Chronicles of Narnia. All the characters who know Aslan will say, he is not a tame lion, but he is safe. And we're going to talk today how Jesus is scary, Jesus is safe, and how Jesus is serious. He means the things that he says. And you know, it is as you and I come to recognize that that is who he is. He is scary, he is safe, and he is serious. That we're invited to do what Peter did. We're invited to respond, not to uh, the vitamin J image of Jesus, but to the actual resurrected king. And every time we're going to have to make a choice. Is our response going to be to run away from him or to run towards him? Now, to understand why John 21 is so incredibly amazing, you actually have to back up in time three years. you got to back up, as a matter of fact, to Luke chapter 5. So if you've got your Bibles, and look, I can see you. Do you have them? Eh, no, they're under the cat. Okay. Luke chapter 5, if you were to turn there. I fully intend to keep the cat joke going. I hope you are not going to fire me for it. Luke 5, three years earlier in time, back up in that time period, and we find ourselves actually in the exact same place. John 21 talks about uh, the Sea of Tiberias. Luke 5 talks about the Lake of Gennesaret. But you know this body of water under the same name. It's the Sea of Galilee. So you back up in time from John 21, three years to Luke chapter 5, and we're literally in the same place. And we're going to watch almost the same scenario unfold. The only thing that's going to be different is how Peter reacts. So Luke chapter 5 says that the fishermen had been out fishing all night, uh, that they'd been fishing all night long, and they caught nothing. Sort of sounds like John 21, right? And that next morning, Jesus shows up. 
and he wants to teach. He gets into Peter's boat and he teaches the people that are there. But when he's finished teaching, Jesus says, verse 4, says to Simon Peter, go out into the deep water, let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night. We haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets. Well, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. They came, they filled both boats so full that the boats began to sink. Sound like John 21? But here's where things get different. Now, John 21, three years after Luke chapter 5, after this huge catch of fish, Peter runs to Jesus. But Luke 5, he reacts very differently. Verse 6 says, I'm sorry, verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, go away from me, Lord. Did you catch that? He looks at Jesus, he falls on his knees right in front of Jesus and says, go away. Get out of here. I, I, I need you to, to leave, to depart from me. Don't stay here. Why? Not about fish. He says, I need you to go, Jesus, because I am a sinful man. Now, we got to camp here for a minute, friends. Because Peter's reaction to Jesus is one that, as far as I'm concerned, makes complete sense. You know, anytime someone comes into the presence, not of a, our equivalent of vitamin C, Jesus, but the actual king, the one who really is the son of God, who genuinely is good, who actually is holy, who was present at the creation of the universe, when you come into the presence of Jesus, he's scary. He's scary because when you come into his presence, it's when you discover all of the things about who you've always been. I still have an up to the prop budget. Peter looks at Jesus and he says, I need you to leave because when you're with me, I know who I am. When you're present, I feel small and I feel insignificant. I am a sinful person. And he's terrified to see who he really is. You know, friends, the, the truth is that all human beings, at our core, we know who we really are. And we don't like it. So we work hard to do what theologians call established and achieved identity. You know what I mean by an achieved identity? It's the one you work for. You work hard to prove, hey, I'm good. And all people do it. You know, there's fascinating psychological studies that where people have looked at or interviewed murderers and rapists, people we wouldn't argue who are good. And the murderer and rapist will talk back to the psychologist and explain how they are, in fact, pretty good people. Because everybody wants to be good. Now, all of us work towards achieving this, this identity where I can convince myself or you or God I'm actually pretty good, and we do it in different ways. Some of us, we are hardwired to believe that we're good because we obey rules. Some of you are hardwired to believe you're good because you buck all the rules. I can tell on Facebook right now who falls where. Some of us, some of us say, I'm really good because of a role I fulfill. I work hard to be a good employee or employer, a good parent, a good child or spouse. Whatever it is, we want to define goodness. Some of you say, I'm really good because I'm financially secure. Now, whatever it is, I'm good because I'm creative and unique. I bring something to this world nobody has. And we live this way. I have my achieved identity. You know, the only problem with an achieved identity is you have to always work for it. I have to constantly convince myself or you or God or whoever I'm trying to convince, this is who I am. But when you get close to Jesus, when he does for you and me what he did for Peter, when he comes really close, and you actually are in the presence of the one who is good, and he doesn't have to work for it, the one who is loved by the Father, and he never has to question it, the one who is actually holy, then Jesus isn't okay with letting us do this. He will actually peel off and take away and expose what's under our sense of good. 
And that gets scary. Listen, if you have never come close enough to Jesus to be scared that he's going to expose you for who you are, then probably you've only been coming close to vitamin J. You get close to the real Jesus, this is what he does. And I don't mean he does it the very first time that you meet him, right? I've been a Christian for 30 years, and my whole life is time after time of Jesus coming close and me being scared that he's going to expose who I actually am. That he's going to show what's behind and underneath my veneer of all things good. He'll do it time and time again. You know why? Because he doesn't want you and I living under an achieved identity. He wants us to function under a received identity. One that can't be taken away. Can't be added to and it can't be subtracted from. Jesus is always, friends, always rewriting stories. He's always inviting us to go deeper in obedience, deeper in faith, to know a new level of his love, to join him in a greater work than we ever thought we could. And it always follows the same pattern. He shows up, and he gets really close, and we get scared. Scared that he's about to show what's actually there. Show the next place that he's inviting us to grow in him. But then the question becomes, how will you respond? Luke 5, Peter's initial response was, go away. Friends, the truth is, I've said it to Jesus. Some of us on the call right now are saying it to Jesus. And and hear me on this. Please don't think, well, because I'm willing to put on at least a shirt that looks nice and show up to Zoom church, then I never say no to Jesus. You can go to church your whole life. You can read the Bible backwards and forwards. You can sing all the songs. You can even cry about them. But when Jesus gets close enough to expose what's true, When he says, I want to take you to this next step, but to get you there, I have to show you who you are and why we need to move. Sometimes we get so scared of what we'll see or think or feel. We tell him to go away. Now he won't, but he also can't rewrite the story. So you got to know the next part about Jesus, friends, which is that he is scary. He will show who we truly are. And he is safe. Always safe. That's why John 21 is so amazing, isn't it? Because it's in John 21 where we see this totally different reaction to what is essentially the same scenario that just jumps. We're meant to read John 21 and hear that Peter and the disciples go out and they go fishing. And they fish all night, and they catch nothing. And then Jesus says, throw your nets, and they catch this huge haul, 153 fish, no less. And we're meant to think of Luke 5. We're meant to remember three years earlier. And I guarantee you, Peter did. There's no way that when they were hauling in those fish, and John said, the guy on the shore, that's the Lord, that's Jesus that Peter did not, in that exact moment, flash to Luke 5. To remember three years earlier at the Sea of Galilee and how scared he was. And I'm willing to bet that in that moment, knowing that just a week or two prior he had denied Jesus publicly, denied Jesus even in a way that Jesus knew about, I bet he got scared all over again on the boat, John 21. The difference, friends, is how he responds, right? Because in Luke 5, Peter's response is, go away. I don't want to feel sinful. John 21, (laughs) he does this goofy thing. He about half gets dressed and then plunges himself into the water to run as fast as he can to be as close to Jesus as is possible. You know why? Because somewhere along the lines, probably somewhere in those last couple weeks, when Jesus was appearing to Peter and the disciples and Cleo and his buddy and Thomas and showing them scars, probably somewhere along those lines, John realized that Jesus is scary and he's safe. 
The thing about Jesus, friends, is that he will, in fact, show us who we are. But did you know he can do what no one else can do? Like, he can actually write the other side of our story, right? That he can say to you and me what he did to Peter, which is, yes, you're sinful, and I can make you saved and sent. And that when Peter runs to Jesus, gets as close to the one that he, who knows him perfectly, he won't be rejected, he won't be sent away, his story will be rewritten. That's why Jesus is safe. Because he's the one who's able to make all things new, including you and including me. And he'll do it over and over and over again as many times as we run. Now, here's the thing. I can't tell you what running to Jesus will look like for you. For Peter, it meant getting off the boat, getting as close to Jesus as he possibly could, and having the really hard conversation. I mean, you, you know, you've heard this preached before. Uh, Peter denied Jesus next to a fire three times. So John 21, Jesus lights a fire and says, come here, Peter. And three times he says, Peter, do you love me? Three times Peter has to say back, yes, I do. And each time Peter knows we are recreating the biggest moment of my sinful life. But when Peter ran to Jesus and he was put in that incredibly uncomfortable position, Jesus is looking back at Peter and saying to him, brother, I rewrote the story. You're not the sinful person anymore. You are the one who has been saved and is sent. And that's still true. For Peter, having his story rewritten required running to Jesus and having the hard conversation. It required being exposed so that he could be put together again. What's it going to look like for you in this season and in this moment? And for some of us, running to Jesus is simply going to mean you look at him and say, Jesus, the truth of the matter is, I've been so scared that you would show me who I really am that I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it means to be in you, your most fundamental identity. And so running to Jesus might mean just saying, I don't want to be so scared of you that I run away. I'm coming. And Jesus, I want to know who I really am in you. For some of us, running to Jesus is going to mean getting a mentor. It's going to mean looking at someone who's a little bit further in their journey with the Lord and saying to them, hey, there's something you know about Jesus. There's some way that he's spoken in your life. Um, I, I really believe the Lord's calling me to deal with my finances, and I think you figured it out. Or God's asking me to really work on my marriage or look at parenting in a different way. Maybe running to Jesus is going to mean saying, I'm going to let there be a mentor who's going to help me actually make some of these changes. For some of us, running to Jesus is going to mean running to counseling and actually dealing with the pieces of life that he is exposing so that we can know healing and grow even deeper in relationship with him. For some of us, running to Jesus means we're just going to join him in the work that he's doing, believing that he is the safest person and the safest place where we can be. Friends, the way that Jesus rewrites our stories always looks the same. Always. He comes, he exposes what is real in our lives, and we get scared because he is scary. And he is safe. And the more that we pursue the one who is safe, the more we invite him to actually do what he did for Peter, to rewrite our stories. I've been praying about this sermon all week, and in my mind, we were stopping here. We were going to talk about how Jesus is scary and safe, that he exposes and does so in order to rewrite, and we were just going to stop. But the more I prayed about it, the more the Lord said, no, you got to finish Peter's story. Listen, for some of us here in this moment, uh, what we're going to talk about next is going to seem irrelevant to you. And if that's where you are, tell Jesus thank you. For some of us, though, the next part of the story of how Jesus rewrites it is really important. For at least some of us in the room, it's the one thing you need to hear. See, Peter came to find out that Jesus was scary. <laughs> he exposed everything about Peter. 
that Jesus was safe and he ran to him and he had the hard conversation. But my guess is that Peter struggled to believe that last point, which is that Jesus is serious. I don't mean Jesus never laughs. I would be willing to add a fourth S and say, I think Jesus is actually pretty sarcastic. He laughs a lot. When I say serious, all I mean is Jesus is serious about what he says. He means it when he says it. I just find it really hard to fathom in my mind any situation where Peter didn't. At the end of three years of royally messing up, read the Gospels. That's all he does, right and left. The end of three years where he denies Jesus publicly three times. You know Peter had to be thinking three years ago, the first time Jesus called me, Jesus said to Peter, and read it, it's at the end of Luke 5, he says, Peter, you don't need to be afraid of me. From this day forward, instead of fishing for fish, you're going to fish for people. That means that the first moment that Jesus rewrote Peter's story, he meant it. You're going to be sent, Peter. You got a place and you have a purpose in my kingdom. He said to Peter, I have a plan A for you. And Peter's plan A was that he was going to be used by the Lord to see other people come to know Jesus. Then three years go by and he really, really screws up. In my mind, I imagine Peter, John 21, at the beach, looking at Jesus, remembering that Jesus had said, I got a purpose and a place for you in my kingdom. I got plan A. But you know that Peter, having walked through the last three years, having especially walked through denying Jesus three times, you know he's thinking about plan A and he's going, I blew it. Plan A doesn't exist for me anymore. At best, at best, Jesus is going to rewrite my story and let me be part of plan B. Friends, some of you think that way. If we had more time today, I would tell you about the time and the spaces in my life. I can think of two seasons in particular where I looked back at Jesus and said, I just know that you're scary and you're safe, but you're not serious. That what you spoke, what you said was plan A, uh, my place and purpose in your kingdom. I've messed it up too much and, and I'm just grateful for a plan B. But here's the thing. You know, Jesus doesn't just say to Peter three different times, do you love me, and make Peter say back, yes, I do. Jesus, every time Peter says, I love you, he says, Peter, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. What's he doing? He's saying, Peter, I was serious. I said you were saved and you were sent. I spoke that three years ago, and there is literally nothing you can do that will change or take away your identity. There is nothing you can do that will change my plans. I'm serious. And he still is for you. Some of you are refusing to run to Jesus, to run where he is, to join him in his work, because you're just so convinced that plan A is gone, that you don't have a purpose, you don't have a place anymore. But friends, do you know how he rewrites stories? He exposes what is true because he's scary. He invites us to do the work of transformation as he rewrites the story, and we can because he's safe. And then he sends us to continue the work that he's called us to because he's serious. What he spoke is what he means. This morning, I want to invite you to pray. I want to invite you to come before Jesus. If you need to come this morning and say, Jesus, you are, are scary to me. And you just need to run to him, to run to the one who will expose you, then do it. If you're ready to say, Jesus, I, I want to believe that you're safe, run to him. Run to him and invite him to do the work of rewriting and, and allowing you to live as one whose story is rewritten, whatever that's going to look like. And if you're hesitating today because you just really don't think he's serious, run. There's only ever been plan A.